coming. Um, we really appreciate you wanting to listen to what we have to say. This is my first time presenting at the Beginning Teachers Conference, so bear with me with that. I'm Alana Golden, by the way. And I'm Alex Mazak. I teach at United Township High School in East Moline. I teach U.S. history to juniors, and I teach modern European history to freshmen through seniors, so it's an elective course. And I teach third grade at the Rock Island Academy on the west end of Rock Island. So we both graduated in the spring. Um, this is our first year teaching, so we figured we'd teach or talk about the differences between student teaching and first year teaching. And I like the concept of a whole new world. One, because then you start singing the song from Aladdin. <laughs> Two, because it is kind of like a whole new world in a lot of ways. So we'll talk about what those look like throughout our presentation. And the handout you got, um, it's the first, it's the blank face there. The head is meant for you to draw any ideas that pop in your head that we actually share. You can put anything that you feel necessary, and if we, you get nothing from it, then you have a free doodle pad and draw our faces. <laughs> it's Alex's suit, so you can do the little black and um, or blue and white. So that's just you can draw anything you want to write in there. You can have. We'll also have little um, resources up on the projector, so if you want to write things down, we'll slow it down so you can write it down. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to kind of get you guys to talk a little bit. Kagan is a cooperative learning um, exercise that you can do. We're going to just call it hand up, stand up, pair up. So you're going to put your hand up and you're going to stand up and you're going to find somebody else who also has their hand up. And you're going to do a high five and you're going to talk about what the question was. For those who are still in college, it says, how would you characterize your student teaching experiences using single words or short phrases? If you're a senior in high school, you're going to say, if you are a prospective student, what do you do to anticipate take what do you anticipate taking away from today's session or your college education? Just kind of talk about what you think you're going to get out of being a college graduate. Okay. So, I know we're not working with a ton of space as well, so we'll work as best we can in here. But I know it's a little cramped. So, so stand up with your hand up and find somebody and high five them. <laughs> 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 Characteristics that you think of, or things that you just think of when you think of student teaching or prospective students, which one? Yeah. Exciting. All right, exciting. This marker's terrible. <laughs> this one's better. Okay. Yes. Yeah. performance thing where you, you, have to, you have to annotate everything that you did, how you taught, your, your, your professors come in and watch you, so something like a big final for teaching. All the abbreviations goes on. Whirlwind. So the whole thing doesn't sound good. <laughs> no, yeah. 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 Organized chaos? <laughs> yeah. Valuable. Alright, so we got a good start yeah. and we have a list that we've created as well with a few things. So we'll work through some of those. We got the TPAC or the TPA. Mm -hmm. Um, like, so appearing professional, something I kind of at the end of these student teaching learned, you know, the correct way to not look like I am a young 22 year old and say, stand next to my other peers at the, the building and stay on my own ground. And that's more of a thing for secondary as well. We're attacking this from two sides. Remember, she's allied and I'm secondary. So when I'm at the high school level, uh, it's making sure that I establish myself as a teacher and not one of the students, because there are some students that are 18 and I'm 22. 
So there's not a very big gap there in terms of age, but in terms of my education and what I'm qualified to do, obviously I'm qualified to teach you. And you'd be surprised, sixth graders are huge in my school. So <laughs> you have to stay my grad too. <laughs> Um, and student teaching, you probably didn't have a whole lot of meetings, or maybe you did have a couple of meetings, but when you do have those meetings, you probably don't need to bring or do anything for those meetings. It's more your cooperating teacher or your mentor teacher that did a lot of that, or they'll feed you the exact things that you need for those. So it's very, very easy and self-explanatory in that sense. Whereas it changes when you get to your first year teaching where you may not, you still don't know a whole lot, but you're expected to. So then it changes, the responsibility is not on, oh, my mentor teacher will tell me about it later. No, you have to pay attention and have to, and know, what to know what they're saying. Next. Like that kind of goes into the low yeah, account no, accountability. No. Not you know your, your mentor, teacher, or your your advisor will helps you through. They kind of hold your hand. Whereas first year teaching, mom's gone, and you have to figure it out on your own. There still is high accountability though during your student teaching. Obviously, when you're planning those lessons every day, that's on you. Um, but we'll talk about some of the differences between what that looks like student teaching and then your first year out. Again, the TPA, uh, TPA, the TPA, because it's coming back into your mind multiple times <laughs> over and over and over again. Come on in. We got a bench here for you. We ran out of seats. <laughs> <laughs> and then one thing, the men your mentor teacher, we talked about that before. That's here, for those of you who haven't done student teaching yet, that's the teacher you are assigned with your, in his or her classroom for the however long your student teaching stint is. And so that's the person that she's your, he or she's your main resource. That kind of goes in the next one. They provide you with the lessons in the beginning, or they show you what 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 books they're using, what curriculum guide there is, and so that's when. Right now, it's it's nice. It's a little scary, obviously, because you're willing to use it, but you still they've given you all of it. You just have to take it and run. So that's something that you probably are experiencing now, or, or you will experience. Or I could say, if I was a student teacher and Alana was my cooperating teacher, I could say, Hey, Miss Golden, I made this awesome lesson. Can we talk about it real quick? And we'll go through it, and then she'll say, Oh. Uh, how about you do this instead, or you change this little thing, or I have this great article that we can incorporate in with that. So those are some things that you might experience or have experienced in your student teaching. Uh, again, the TPA probably comes back into mind again because you freak out about it a lot. A lot of people do. And then, and then having your and then having your advisor, your August Santa professors with you with you the whole way. They they come and observe you, then they come and they um, talk talk to you about your lessons. You meet with them during class times, after class times in their office. It's so just a comfortable thing that you probably are experiencing or you will experience at Oxina. They're great. And then we do have <laughs> all of these other things that you said. It is an exciting time. It is a rewarding time. Again, those are words that can be used for first year teaching. Learning, you should always be learning, a lifelong learner. Uh, the TPA, that's more specific to just student teaching, but I'll talk about a connection to that here in a moment. Exhausting. Yes, it's your job as a student and as a student teacher. And then as a teacher, it's your full-time job now so you see that as well whirlwind there's always things coming at you and then the others are pretty self-explanatory as well uh, this is a fun little political cartoon that I found um, obviously you can read but it says I gave the same advice to all I give the same advice to all new teachers pretend you know what you're doing so again with that whirlwind <laughs> approach there's a lot of stuff thrown at you and sometimes you don't know what's going on all the time but you have to do your best to make it seem like you do <laughs> So a couple things for your first year, and obviously we are in our first year, so we're experiencing the whirlwind, and these are just some of the things that we notice most. It might vary based on what you experience or someone else, but here are a few things. Yeah. So don't limit yourself to how you talk about that. Yeah, you don't want to limit yourself. A lot of people, when they come out of their student teaching experience or their education experience, they think, well, I went to this high school, and I'd really like to go back to this high school. I'd really like to go back to this city. Or I'd really like to just make it to this area. And while that is really nice and really beneficial, hopefully at some point in your career, you have to be open to the opportunity of kind of teaching wherever or applying in places where you might not have assumed you would apply initially and kind of feeling out those opportunities. So don't limit yourself just based on the blinders that you can put on and say, I'm only going to get a job here. Because if you try that, it is very likely that you will not have great success trying to yeah. get into that school. A great example is, well, our good friend Kate's here. Um, she's also in her first year teaching. She doesn't like to speak in front of people, so she's kind of like our moral support. <laughs> but just to kind of tell her story, she went, she's from the Chicago area, and so she went back home looking to find a job there, and it was hard. And so, and I'm from Rock Island, so it was kind of easier for me to teach in Rock Island. It was, I had already made connections, so I was lucky enough to find a job here. But Kate actually moved home and then moved back blindly a week after school had already started without, didn't have a place to live yet, but you know, she didn't limit herself. She knew that she, 
teach him what she wanted to do so she wasn't going to just wait for the greatest school ever to call or her perfect school she you know she found the job and knew knew where she was needed and came so if you you may have that kind of experience where you may think you're you're set but you might have to shake the boat a little bit and try something new so don't limit yourself enter with open expectations um that kind of ties into the fact that you have to remember that um Everyone has everyone has a different background. Everyone comes from different things. You may not have the same experience that your students have. So when you come in the classroom, do not always expect for them to be the same kid that you were when you were in third grade. Their experiences today are ten times different, or it could be ten worse or ten times better, depending on what it is. So you have to have an open mind when you're coming into when you're coming into the world with thirty or forty new kids and or one hundred and fifty new students. You have to keep that in mind and just try to. It may be hard at first. Admittedly, it is actually kind of hard to remember that what you expect may not always be what they. Can give you and to try to find that happy medium. Even on a smaller level, when you try and talk about a skill, like on Friday I talked about annotation with some of my students, and we all know what annotation is, or probably know what annotation is. And I asked them, "Do you know what annotation is?" And they look at me like you're just saying a weird, funny word that I've never heard before. So then we have to break it down and talk about what those actual things are. So I have an expectation for what I want them to know but they don't know it yet. So we have to build that expectation a little bit for the future. Exactly. Um, you are not rich, no. which um, goes into just the field that you're going into. Um, a lot of supplies are needed, um, maybe daily school supplies, maybe curriculum supplies, and so on and so forth. Um, teacher salaries are not the highest. Everybody probably knows that one. Um, but it's key that you don't spend all of your money or too much money on the things that you need. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll find the best way to do something with the least amount of resources and it'll still work very well. Um, so just not running down your bank account too much. Yeah, and just kind of keep it in mind, you know, we all think, okay, post-grad, I'm in the college, I'm super broke, but now I have a job and I can go out and get a new express outfit if I want. So nice, you have to remember that Yes, your new job came, but so did maybe you have to find an apartment and a car. So just kind of keep in mind, we're just speaking real person to person, that your first year teaching is going to be similar to the same amount of money you make in college. And you have to keep in mind that what you, which, what you have and what you have to spend, and also in your classroom, especially for elementary. Um, you know, you have to have, have the pretty borders and all the pretty posters and all that, and just like the same thing Alex said, keep in mind that you can make things and you need to be, don't always look for Target. Target's awesome and I love it, but you can't buy everything in Target. You'll find that. If you don't, if you don't love Target now, you will love Target in a year. Um, and just keep that in mind that you will have to just kind of be smart about what you're spending. Um, here at Augustana, those of you that go here, uh, when you think of your email, you probably think of lots and lots of emails coming every day about random topics or maybe things that you're associated with. Um, those of you that are prospective students, that's something that happens here at Augustana, you get a lot of emails. Um, that's something that will not change even when you go on into your uh, job. Except for you, you actually have to read them because it might seem they're important, like <laughs> when the paycheck's coming or when the, what the board agreed upon or the new expectations for the new assessments, you actually have to read it. So, <laughs> there will still be a lot of emails. I know that's something that when I thought about, like, oh, I'm graduating, I won't have as many emails. You'll still have as many emails. This one is probably one of the hugest ones that outside and talks on a, on a weekly basis about. Um, here at Augustana and um, I mean high school in general, you know, you're kind of spoon fed a little bit. They, they kind of gradually take you off of it and they t you have to expect a little bit more, like at 300, Miranda gives that ex extremely big syllabus. You kind of had to learn on your own, but, and that's pretty much the same feeling you get when you first year teaching, except for everyone's really nice to you. But you, whatever you need to know, you are. It's on you to find it. And like you have to, for example, if you need, to, if you want to know exactly when are we going to take this quarterly assessment, or when when do you have to start preparing for the ISAT, or whatever whatever it is, you have to go and ask someone. If you have no idea what TPAC means, you're going to have to go ask someone. You can't sit and like. It's really it's it's hundred percent on you. Yeah, um, I just think of it this way. Like when I'm at school. The teachers around me are all teaching, but they've taught for a few years. They've got some lessons that they use. They're set up in some of their ways. I'm trying to find all of that. I'm creating my curriculum. I'm creating my lessons, I'm creating my assessments, all these different things. And um, sometimes we have an assembly, and I just don't even know what the schedule is going to be. And maybe they'll send an email out, but I'm curious. You just got to find somebody and ask them. Um, otherwise, you're going to feel like you're kind of your own island and you don't want to isolate yourself like that. So you need to make sure that you're talking to other people, letting them know maybe what you're struggling with or what you need to find. And sometimes they'll say, hey, I have this great resource. Sometimes they'll say, hey, you need to look here. 
sometimes it'll be that easy. But all, the teachers are just like you. They're busy in their classrooms. They have their own expectations they're dealing with too. So it's you have to kind of ask someone. They're not. They're going to be too busy to necessarily ask if you're okay so on an hourly basis. Should I say? The next one: full moons, holidays, and weekends. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could think back to your your schooling careers, there were days where you probably just weren't feeling it at school. And some of those days occur closer to breaks, closer to the weekend, coming off of the weekend. So you'll find sometimes that like, maybe Monday's not very good, maybe Friday's not very good. Wednesday you get out early. So it's Wednesday you get out early. <laughs> so maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays are really good days. Or maybe this week, all the days are really good. And the next week, all of them are kind of just up and down. It's like a roller coaster run. So you'll find sometimes you have to work with your students in the best way possible to still accomplish what you need, but at the same time meet them where they are because maybe they're not as willing to do what they need to that day. And it may seem like such a big deal to you now. But as a student, you kind of look for those. You love them to have an assembly. You love them to like a break in your day. It really shifts. It's a mind shift when you're the teacher. You, I absolutely hate when there's indoor recess and they're going to be in there with me all day long. <laughs> and, or or I, you begin to really, when they, you can tell as a full moon, as a teacher, it's a mind shift. You look, you kind of think those things are fun and happy. You cherish today's just a normal 8 to 3.30 day, no interruptions, and, and you really have to kind of um, keep yourself on track and not let that mess you up as a teacher and have you still keep to your pace and guide and keep to what you, your expectations are for your classmates, even through all of their many, many interruptions. The next one, the TPA is back. <laughs> well, it's not back itself because you will never do it again. While you are a teacher, you will be evaluated with the Danielson model, most likely if you're in Illinois or another state. It might depend, but it's a model used across the board in a lot of places. And what we did with the TPA in terms of gathering artifacts, all the things we do, the lessons, lesson plans that we've written over the course of your years here at Augustana, go directly into that and benefit you greatly. Um, what I've found is working through the TPA and working through the system that I came up in here at Augustana has greatly benefited me when working on my artifact binder. Because you still need to gather artifacts and show them specifically how you're meeting specific goals. And I'm finding that a lot of the teachers that have been there for a while are asking like, what's an artifact? Or how do I find my artifacts? <laughs> and I'm talking them through, well, all you need maybe is if you worked on something, just give a copy of that worksheet. Or maybe you make a copy down of your schedule. Little things like that that some of us are very accustomed to. Yeah, so Augustana perfects prospective students. Augustana gets you ready for that. We try, it was an easy transition being an Augustana grad versus going to other schools. Okay. The Google is one. your best friend. And we actually have a list of different um, websites that are really good to go to as first year teachers. But I mean, it's kind of self explanatory. You may think, okay, I, I, like for example, I need to teach all the different kinds of energy. I need to teach chemical energy, mechanical energy, la la la. I mean, I am, I've am i done that since third grade, so I may have to remember how to teach that or what's the best way to. Google is awesome. Teachers have a great way, have a this great knack for sharing information and it's a new technology age, so a lot of what you think you need is online. Do not recreate the wheel. It's your first year teacher, you have a lot more to do. You have way more things on your plate than trying to think of a really cool new way on your own of how to do this. Use the internet, use your resources. But at the same time, don't Google something, don't Google like Abraham Lincoln lesson plan and then like click on the first one and print it out. Yeah. Maybe that's a starting <laughs> point for you. Maybe that gives you an idea of like, oh, we could do an activity like this. And then you create your own based off of that. But there are a lot of good things online, and there are a lot of really, really horrid things it's online so in terms of trying to do them with your students. So use it as kind of like a catalyst to get you to a location, but don't use it as the end-all, be-all. And we have some really good websites for you later on. It's OK to fail. There are some days where things will go really, really well. And there are some days where things will basically crash and burn and you might feel like crying. And it's that's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a learning process. Remember, it's a constant learning uh, cycle overall as you're doing things. Some classes, things will work better with other, than with others. And you've probably seen that if you've student taught or you will student teach. Some classes, you may be able to do an activity or you may not be able to do that activity at all with that class. So the highs are high and the lows are low, but what you need to know at the end of the day is you're doing a good job. And you're doing what you need to do to make sure that those kids benefit and learn the topics that you're discussing. Um, so the 12 to 15 hour days are normal. Um, first quarter, 
I don't really how many hours it was Kate and I talked to I, we were there for maybe I, I went to work every day at 530 and I left about six or seven and that was the consistent Monday through Friday for the first quarter just kind of understanding that was and it sounds really scary and maybe maybe if you already are kind of a hard worker maybe it doesn't sound so scary but to spend you know 15 hours in the same room can be a little daunting and just I guess it's, it's just going to be kind of terrible so just kind of know that in the beginning but know that what you're doing the difference between working in, as a teacher and working and working in another position you're investing in yourself those hours that you're putting and you're putting into yourself and you're putting into your students so I, I guess just keep the, the overall goal in mind that knowing yes it, that was a very long week you put in 100 hours this week but that you did that for yourself to make yourself better and you did that for your 150 students and so it's that's kind of hard to remember but no and at the same time it's going to get easier your yes. first time where you're on your own and doing things it's difficult because you're floundering sometimes you're doing really well you're learning like maybe I should have asked a question there to somebody and you'll learn those steps to make the process a lot easier later on and you'll plan for a whole month and have it knocked out instead of having a plan like the night before or something like that. Alex can do that. <laughs> I'm working on that still. <laughs> um, the last one adult meetings are a lot like college meetings sometimes you go to a meeting for a group or an organization or something and you'll leave the meeting and you'll kind of think well I don't know what I'm really taking away um, some meetings are productive, some are like that. You're going to have a lot of meetings still that are a lot like that. And you'll find that teachers can sometimes be very negative people and talk about um, some complaints or things that they have. So it's your goal and your job to stay very positive and try and find other people that are positive to stay positive with you. So we have some reminders and some outcomes to leave you with a few things before we give you some sources. Um, basically to feed off what I just said, find your support. At school, find your teachers. Some of you might have a mentor teacher, some of you might not. Um, I know you both have mentor teachers, I don't have a mentor teacher. So I had to go out of my way to make sure I found a couple teachers where I could ask them and say, hey, I need some help with this, could you show me some of your resources, this or that, I've got some questions for you. At the same time, your job is teaching. Your life is not teaching. So you need to have things that are parts of your life still that you do it for enjoyment to separate the two. For example, the three of us get together, usually on Fridays, and we meet for book club. And for book club, we just meet and get dinner and hang out and talk about a few of the things from school, but then we stop and we leave it behind and we talk about things that have nothing to do with school. Because at a certain point, you can't do anything more about it. The week has ended. It is your time, it is the weekend. You need to prep for next week and get ready for something new. Exactly. You time, which kind of really ties into the first one, where you have to find things. Ooh, you just said it. You have to find things that you actually enjoy doing that don't involve school, and it, or it could be you find your niche within the school. Sometimes it's very hard, especially um, just speaking from an elementary standpoint. You are responsible for every subject. You're responsible for science, for math, for English and reading, and you have to find your niche in there. You have to find exactly what it is that I'm trying to get pull from my students over this course of this year, or even this week. So you, the you time, find something that you're passionate about because it can get a little mundane if you're teaching the, out of the same textbook. You have to teach up like a, a pace guide for math, for example. Like if you're in Moline, Saxon math, it's an awesome resource, but it gets a little repetitive after a while. Find your niche. Maybe my, my niche this week, for example, was I had to make sure my kids understood what citizenship was because they were getting a little catty. So that's where something that I found that was important to me that I spent this week investing in my students and in myself to teach them. So finding your niche kind of also applies, but that also also connects to Alex to find something outside of school as well. Yeah, and it might be five minutes, it might be a couple of hours. It might be that that day was really tough for you and you still have a lot to do, but at a certain point you need to okay. tell yourself, you're done. It's 10 o'clock, I'm done, because I'm gonna be at school again in less than 12 hours, and I need a fresh start to things. So you'll get it done, or you'll find a way to get it done, but you need to tell yourself, I need some time just for me, to listen to music, to watch a movie, to just sit, to read anything for you. You need to continuously grow, and that's pretty self-explanatory, but use the opportunities that are given to you as well. I attended a conference two weeks ago, the National Conference of the Social Studies, which is pretty neat to go down to St. Louis. I also applied for a scholarship that was given for that, and I got to go for free. So all those opportunities for me to continuously grow, you have to look for them sometimes, but sometimes they're that easy where once you put the work in, you're there for free and you have an abundance of resources in terms of articles, in terms of books, and then in terms of people that you can meet yes. and exchange information. And your, your um, administration loves that. They really do encourage you. You may seem like, well, I'm overwhelmed, so I'm first year teaching. I just need to focus on getting my ducks in a row. 
yes, you do, but you do have an opportunity to, you're still learning, and, and so don't, don't shorten yourself in that way. I went to a Lego education conference for two days, and it, it was in the this first quarter, like we had an idol school for a month. I said, I can't leave my kids. I've only known them for a month. They, they're not ready for me to leave, and it was the best thing I could have done. I learned how to use literally Legos to teach reading, and it was a great experience for two days, and I can give you more information if you want, Allison. I saw you big the eyebrow. <laughs> and, and it was just, it was amazing, and I was able to also then kind of meet other, other teachers in the district, and it was an awesome time to spend and uh, have the professional development moment where you're talking to the teachers about what they're doing in their rooms and just get great ideas that way. So though, yes, you do, your, your number one concern is getting through your first year. Don't shortchange yourself, short yourself. Make sure you're giving yourself things that you would like to do as well, learning more. Don't get down on yourself. Like I said, there will be some days that are great and some days where you say, I don't know if that one went as well as I had hoped. But at the end of the day, know that you're doing a great job. At the end of the day, know that there are some factors that you cannot control, but those students bring them into the classroom and you have to do your best to deal with that. Maybe there's a death in the family. Maybe they're moving. Maybe this, maybe that. You have to find a way to best work with those students. And some days it's going to be frustrating and some days it's going to be really easy. To kind of bounce off, we've all seen like Freedom Riders and Dangerous Minds and all that. Those are great movies, and they're based off real people. But you may not always feel like the heroine or the hero at the end of the day. And please just kind of remember that that you have tomorrow, you have the rest of the year to so try to make that connection. That your expectation for yourself, keep that that you want to make a change and that you want to be that person. Do not lose the fire that you were you're graduating with. But do know that every day is not going to be, yeah, I saved someone's life today. <laughs> and it was hard for me to realize that, but you just have to know that about yourself. And like Alex said, find those small victories. Keep your cool lessons. Uh, we kind of mentioned it a couple times. Not everything's going to work. But just because it doesn't work once, one year with one class, doesn't mean you throw it all in the garbage. Keep it in your arsenal, your bag of tricks, and use it or use elements of it at other points and other times. Um, relevance. Yeah, and then relevance, the last one. The biggest way you're going to connect with students, irregardless of what your topic yeah. is, irregardless of what you're studying, you need to make it connectable to their life. You need to make it something where it's tangible for them to see or to taste or to hear or to touch anything where they can see and know that that makes sense for what I'm doing or why I'm living my life right now. All right, so now we have some resources for you, books and then websites. So we'll run through some of these um, and a lot of them are teach like something. Uh, the first one, teach like a pirate, is more of a social studies book. Um, but it's doing neat things with social studies curriculum. So um, like when you talk about prohibition or you talk about um, the jungle when there was meat packing in Chicago, you bring in like cocktail weenies and you have everybody eat them. And you say like, well, did you taste the dead rat in there? And then you freak them out a little bit and you say no, but they would have back then when they were eating that without regulation. So some just weird things that you do to get them connected. Teach like a champion. This one here. This gives you great examples of how you can. This was a little 479 techniques that put students on the path to college. Other things I kind of like about it. It helps you kind of reach, the, reach those kind of hard, those unmotivated students. Another another example. I can't remember the name of it. But for example, you may have a class. There's one student who's in the back. He's sleeping, or she's doodling, or she's pretending to text on her phone. Or I'm, I have third grader, so usually he's just in la la land. And you have to. You're, you, want, you want to get them, but you don't want to lose everybody else. A technique that is given in this book is you use, it's kind of a rally thing. So for example, I may ask you, what's one plus one? You have no idea. So I come back to you. I ask someone else and I come back to you again. But the, the whole point was never let a, a student get the opportunity to back out and to just not, not participate in learning. And it gives you just really easy, quick to do little techniques to try in, in the classroom to help students teach like a chance. <laughs> Uh, Teach Like Your hair on, Hair's on Fire is another book, uh, just kind of doing things outside the box, doing things to get kids really passionate about what they're talking about. Um, so similar to the other ones there. The First Day of School by Harry and Rosemary Wong. Um, it's similar to the book Teach Like a Champion, but it's the book that my district gave me on the first day of school. It just kind of runs through a lot of the daily things that you may not even think about, um, but it's a nice resource to have as you're working your way through things. And has some behavior management stuff in there as well. Yeah. And another great behavior management one and that I found, and a little tidbit, a lot of these books I've happened to find were on other teachers' desks, and I just asked them, can I look at that? Or you, or in your, uh, this one I found in my principal's office. I'll talk about that one later. I just happened to look and he and let, let asked to borrow it. So you, know, you, you have a great set of books that August has provided for you, and you will use them. But don't be afraid to kind of pay attention to what your coworkers have, have as well. Students Speak is um, it's a great resource for behavior management. But what it does is it kind of gets into the psyche of why kids 
why your high flyers, your misbehaviors act the way they do. A little tidbit, it has four kids act up for four main reasons. And the four main reasons are, oh, Lord have mercy, it's because they want to feel included, they want to feel confident, they want, ex they want affection, and they want control. Now, those are the songs, repeat that, inclusion, control, affection, competency. And so that kind of motivates what the, why the kids act when they do. So this book kind of really helps you meet those goals or take them away regardless of what it is. So if the kids have a control issue, helps you understand how to be better guide them through that. It's awesome for any age level and for behavior management. Making the most of small groups. Um, if you've taken it, reading with Randy, the, the Rudell text that, he, that she read in it with his class is awesome. This is another great resource because it, it's really great for first year teachers because sometimes we're not in college anymore, you don't always have time to go back through and read through all the heavy text of your textbooks. This one's really, it says, you should do this or you should try this very explicit, user friendly, can quickly cite it really fast and get back to your lesson. It kind of goes through how you should set up your guided reading. Because in, in student teaching, or if you're helping and volunteering in clinicals, the teacher's already done that. You just have to go in and sit down and just do what they've already provided. This helps you build your classroom and, and get your groups together for reading. And then, oh, do I have one more? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Lastly, it's no big deal. It's just the continuum of literacy learning. Um, in most districts now, especially in elementary, reading is a huge push. Alex has, an option, has the luxury of teaching concentrated social studies, but in elementary, time is not always of the essence, and you, it's really hard to get to those. Um, science and social studies, reading is always the hugest push. This helps you differentiate your text, and it's awesome. Because Fonta Simpanel is a huge reading, reading guru, people that help you with the level of text and then helps you with the different reading strategies, and this is a great way to kind of use this to then help you then teach science through science and social studies through this text here. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> All right, some of our most essential websites that we find ourselves visiting. Um, one big one is teacherspayteachers.com. Maybe you've visited, maybe you've not. Um, there, it's a website where basically if you're a teacher, you can load some of what you do on there, uh, be it lessons, be it worksheets, be it presentations and then you can charge other people for your work. Um, so maybe it's something that you'd be interested in putting some of your work up as well. Or there's some work on there that's just free and you can check out what it is. There's samples of what you can look at and that's every content area, every grade level, kind of all over the place. You just have to dig around a little bit to find some of the things and maybe cheaper than others. And it's really, really good for first year teachers because unfortunately you may not always have the textbook that other teachers have, have, have spent the money and went and bought. So you have to create your own curriculum a lot of, in a lot of instances. Kate and I specifically had to do that. Where, and right now with the new Common Core switch, you know, everything has to be Common Core aligned in that, with the state standards. And so a lot of the older teachers have maybe have went to, been to workshops and started buying those kind of materials. Teachers Pay Teachers is a quick way to usually quickly and cheaply buy a full Common Core aligned math curriculum that you can use in your classroom. On Pinterest, that you may say, well, duh. If you don't have a Pinterest, it, Pinterest is for guys to do not be afraid of the Pinterest. It has awesome, awesome resources Seriously. of just crafts. And they, they have a lot more academic. If you, you, I know we use it a lot of for social things and for hairstyles and that kind of thing. But if you were to Pinterest, Common Core State Standards or How Do I Meet My Danielson Framework on Pinterest, you will be surprised at the creative other masterminds in the world that are coming up with things and they're just trying to share it with you. I put the Common Core website on there. Um, most of you probably use that or go to it all the time, but um, that's something that's pretty essential. I printed them off and put them in a binder as well. And then, like Alana said, anything Common Core aligned. So FC yeah, FCR is a, is a research-based um, literacy. It has a lot of different literacy games. Will Cabin is also Common Core aligned, but it has like you, you can print off the little activity you can do in small group or large group, just easy, quick, and it's also differentiated for grade level as well. Reading A to Z is an awesome website. You, this is the one you do have to pay to have. You have to have a subscription. But when you get to your first year teaching, what they offered, a lot of us, 10 teachers went on, went in and bought it together. So everybody paid $10. And now we have the subscription for a whole year. And uh, Reading A to Z is great because it stays up to date with what the expectations are for, for the state standards. So it has Common Core aligned. It has, it has like close reading as a new strategy that everyone's pushing, pushing, pushing heavy to use. And it, it's also a differentiated meaning. It has, if you have a third grader who is a low reader, it has the low, medium, high, and it has great different little activities that are already made. You can you can implement them how you see fit, but the resources are there. As a first year teacher, you may not have the awesome library that you think you're going to have. It's going to cost. It's going to take some money and time to build it. Re Reading agency has books on that you can print off and have paper books for them to read, and they can have intangible and take home. So just right there, at the click of a button. So it's nice. And then Mesh English. Um, unless you 
teach in La La Land, you're going to have a student that doesn't speak English. And especially in the Rock Island, in the Quad City area, Alex and I both have quite a few students who are English language learners. And it's an awesome website that has different vocabulary activities for them to do. It's a lot of picture to word association. It's just an awesome, it, it, you can do things interactive online or you can print them off to have copies. And it's, it's a really has a lot of the heavy, heavy visual, visualization, excuse me, that'll help with your English language learners. Because that is something that I am passionate about, but it is, as a teacher, it is going to be one of us, as a struggle, honestly, to be able to make sure you're including those students into your classroom. For example, I do have two students. One came from Thailand, literally came from Thailand to my room, and he's awesome, but he has no idea what we're saying all day long. And he gets an hour out of the classroom where he gets kind of, kind of concentrated instruction. If not, other than that, I have to find pockets of time to be able to explain to him what's going on or find this different little resources for him to be able to do. But remember, even though that they don't speak English, he's still the same age as the rest of the students. So giving him an ABC book is, you know, is it, it affects his pride. So I have to be able to you experience that as well. You can talk about that. Yeah. Um, I just have a lot of students in high school or in junior high, more in high school, you'll find that apathy is one of the biggest problems where it's just like, I'm too cool to care or I'm too cool to read or maybe you're an English, English language learner and you're just having a hard time reading as we kind of build on things or we're reading something from like 1770 and like the language is like all funky and weird and I ask them like, well, would, would you want to talk like that today? And they all say no, but um, just some of those things that you notice and you want to do your best to make sure that those students can succeed. Um, I say every day, my job as a teacher, um, I don't teach social studies, I teach children how to think, but I use social studies as a medium to get them there. So hopefully you, you teach whatever content area, but you teach the kids how to learn, or you teach the kids how to think critically. So that's yeah. what I talk about. So ultimately, through the highs and the lows and everything though, um, it's still rewarding, it's still exciting. To see the change from day one, even to now right before Christmas time, to what it might be in May is crazy in high school and then even more so in the elementary level. Yeah, it is, definitely. Um, and though we, there are times like we, when we were preparing this, we kind of were kind of like, became like a, a grumbling session. We're like, oh, this is, this is frustrating, this is frustrating. Then we remembered that, um, Remember where you, how you're feeling right now, and where you're sitting, and how we felt there too. And it was like six months ago, so I'm not going to get all high horse right now. I understand that it was six months ago, um, but remembering that, you know, Randy and all the pressers here, they are on the whole other spectrum. So we kind of just want to provide you kind of what it's like to be in that little middle. Yes, um, we're new, we're, we're fighting through, but we, we understand that eventually we're going to get to the awesome, glorful, glorified stories that they tell us that, that you're hearing now. Just do things your way. Uh, my students ask me all the time, "Why do you smile so much?" And um, they look at my ID card and they say, that doesn't even look like you, but you're smiling so much. You look genuinely happy and nobody else ever does. Like, do little things that make you stand out where they can say, like, wow, he's a great teacher. She's a great teacher because of these little things. And they might be really weird. Last week, my kids wouldn't work during my one period. And we were talking about the Civil War. And we were listening to Civil War music. So I put it on the background, and then I started doing the Carlton dance from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and they were dying. And then they were listening to the music, and they got involved in things. So just do little quirky things that will set you apart. Do things that might be out of the box, might not work, but it's worth a shot. So what we'll do now is, if anybody has any questions, we can take those. And then there's one thing on the back side of that sheet that yeah. Alana can yeah. describe to you. Too. Any questions about right now? And you can be like not necessarily. It can be how we feel as virtual teachers. It's fine. It doesn't have to be academic focused. We won't hold you then on the back side of it. We, we want to leave you with an activity that you could use like tomorrow in student teaching or whenever you're teaching. It's called the hamburger review activity and so it explains how to do it. Pretty much you can use it at any grade level, kindergarten, whatever. If you're trying to review something and get a kid to remember practicing before a big test or before an assessment or whatever, you do the hamburger game. And so for example, there's there you have a, you get a burger, you can create it. You get a, make a burger, a bun, make a um, make the meat, make the lettuce, make the cheese, make the ketchup, make the mustard, and you have all those little pe paper pieces or you can use blocks and have them in vision that's a hamburger by having a green block or a yellow block. You can make it be as creative as you'd like. And as you're asking, you can do it in a small group or individual. As you're asking the kids the questions, hey, who remembers what one plus one is? Whoever gets it, all right, you, you, you add one piece to your hamburger. Or who remembers what date Martin Luther King was assassinated? All right, you add your piece to that. Or who knows how to conjugate the verb in Spanish? You get your piece, or in German. You add your piece, so you have to do that. You can add, you can add it in, and then once they build their burger, 
you, that's the end of the activity. It's just a fun way that you can use tomorrow if you wanted to teach something or review something. And for secondary, don't think it's too campy, because if you think about it, people are very competitive. Yes. High school students are very competitive. So if it's winning this game or making sure my burger is built before your burger is built, they're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your that. time. Thanks you, for guys, you guys have like the quirky. Oh, I put those on the end, but okay. uh, a few fun ones. Uh, if you ever go on BuzzFeed, they've got some more books that'll make you a better teacher. And then they've got one about 33 signs that you are a new teacher. Some of you may have seen it. Things like you just smile to avoid awkward contacts and things like that. <laughs> that is all. Thank you.